Good evening and welcome to the Royal Society of Edinburgh and thank you for joining us this evening whether in person making it through the wind and rain or online through YouTube. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm Joanne Wheeler, Managing Partner at Alden Legal and Director of the Earth and Space Sustainability Initiative. And I'm honoured, truly honoured to be here this evening, uh, particularly as a proud Edinburgh girl. And it's been excellent to engage with Max Alexander and Professor Andy Lawrence. And thank you to the Royal Society of Edinburgh for hosting us this evening. Now, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. We are not expecting a fire alarm, but if one goes off, please exit the building the way you came in and head up to the dome, and there will be staff here to help us and direct. We won't be taking questions through the talks, but please keep your questions and we'll do a Q&A just at the end. If you would like to ask a question and you're online, please put it in the chat and hopefully we'll, we'll read your question out at the end. Well, thank you again for joining us this evening. Outer space and the night sky have been humanity's constant from our very beginning, and I hope for generations to come. But our perspective of space is changing, and our use of space is changing us. We look more at our screens nowadays than the skies, and no longer look to the stars to forecast the weather as a clock or a calendar. Yet in 2024, we rely on outer space more than we ever have before. And as the King stated, we must now develop a sustainable way, a durable way of benefiting from space, just as we must here on Earth. And I would add that we need to recognise our shared responsibility for the Earth and space ecosystem, our home. Now, arguably, territorial behaviour in space has already taken precedence over a considered collaboration. The number of debris objects tracked by space surveillance networks is now over 35,150, all over five centimetres, and some larger than a Lothian bus, double-decker. There are about 9,000 active satellites and almost 60% belonging to one commercial American company. Now, to put this into perspective, just four weeks ago, two satellites came between five and 20 metres close to each other. Metres. Now, I remember when it was a close conjunction was 22 kilometres, five and 20 metres together. Now, had this resulted in a collision, the amount of debris and earth object would have increased by 50%. We are seeing close encounters more than we ever have before, and particularly in the last few years. And the SpaceX Starlink spacecraft, for example, made collision avoidance manoeuvres 50,000 times in the 12 months to December 2023. This is a complex problem without a panacea. Now, yes, we have five international space treaties, but none of them deal with space debris conclusively. And countries apply international law regulation inconsistently, and there's no level playing field. Now, over 80% of activities now are commercial. And I do believe the greatest and most significant change towards the space sustainability will come from pro the private sector, and maybe in the incentivized private sector. Now, certain behaviors in space will and are harming the ability of companies to serve the users, to access insurance, finance, to serve other countries, and quite simply to generate revenue. It is the interest of commercial operators now to behave responsibly and sustainably in orbit. Now, I'm seeing incentives for satellite operators to avail themselves of licenses from regulators like the UK Space Agency, which take space sustainability seriously. We can, through licensing, insurance, finance and market access, create commercial incentives to use space sustainability practices. Now, we stand today at a critical juncture. We must act to ensure that space is sustainable, safe, and accessible for future missions for other countries and our country and generations unborn. We need to ensure that space continues to support the environmental, economic, and scientific interests of current and future generations. And we need to continue to be able to 
benefit from space and all of the vital satellite and earth applications and encourage the development of new applications and innovation. And we're at a juncture where we have to put aside competitive differences and come together to produce an international, multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral response enabled by clear and transparent standards and incentives. We need to apply new ways of managing space sustainably, applying greater stewardship. Now, if we were to all meet back here in 25 years' time and look back on this decade, I hope we would recognise a turning point in this understanding. And to help us achieve and appreciate what this turning point should look like, I'm going to introduce, and I have great pleasure to introduce, our two guest speakers. Max Alexander is a photographer and creative strategist who specialises in science communication through visual storytelling. He freelances for a number of prestigious organisations around the world, including the UK and the European Space Agencies and the Square Kilometre Array. He also generates and delivers large-scale projects, and quite honestly, his photography touches hearts and minds. And Professor Andy Lawrence is the Regis Professor of Astronomy at the University of Edinburgh and a speci specialist in the physics of quasars. He has long been involved in making surveys of the sky, which is what led him to study the issues we're about to hear about tonight. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Andy Lawrence to set the scene. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. So that's our opening slide. That's the three of us, uh, Joanne, myself, and Alexander, um, Max Alexander. Uh, you're going to get me briefly, and then the meet is Max, and then I'll come back, and then we're going to have a, um, a Q&A session. So that's the, the plan. So um, you've heard from Joanne, uh, and now me. Okay, so I'm going to um, kick us off this evening um, by describing four shocks that I've had over the last few years. Um, but first, let me explain something. Um, there's three things uh, I've always loved through my whole life, pretty much. The first is galaxies. The second is computers. <laughs> and the third is space. Um, so there's me and Yuri Gagarin in 1963. Um, I'm the one on the right. <laughs> So um, it, during my career, those three things um, came together. So I take pictures of galaxies using telescopes in space, uh, and then I analyze them on computers. But here we go with shock number one. Late 2019, streaks started appearing in astronomers' um, images. Uh, now, I'm sure most of you know uh, at this stage what, what these are. These are Starlink satellites. Uh, streaking uh, across the sky and uh, in, invading, photobombing our images. It's not just professional astronomers, amateur astronomers um, as well. Is Andrew Farrow here, actually? No, he's not. But anyway, uh, so uh, a member of the Astronomical Society here in Edinburgh. That's one of his pictures. Ordinary people, too. I think over the last few years, whenever you get to a reasonably uh, clear sky somewhere, you're more likely to see satellites crawling across the sky uh, than used to be uh, the case. Now, um, there's always been satellite trails uh, occasionally in our images. So, uh, so what's new? Why is this so bad? Okay, so here is shock number two. Uh, it's the rate of growth. So um, this is a bit technical. So here we have a, a graph. So this is the number of objects against um, a year. Here. So just concentrate for now on this blue line. We'll come back to some of the others later. This is the number of working satellites, active satellites, as a function of time. And you can see that as of just a few years ago, it started going crazy. Okay? Zooming up. Um, uh, so the, the worry is not just how many satellites are there now. It's where is this going to stop? Where is it going? What is it going to be like in 10 years? or 20 years, uh, we just don't know where this is going to end. And I began to realize, as this worried me and many other astronomers, that it's, um, it's not just astronomy. Okay? As the sky becomes more crowded, it becomes harder for commercial operators as well. So if you're running a communications satellite, it's more and more likely 
that some other satellite will um, cross the line of sight to your ground station or your uh, consumer user terminal uh, and satellites will interfere with each other. So the sky is becoming more crowded. Okay, but uh, then of course worrying about these things, I remembered that it's not just about the large things. We know that, um, uh, as has already been mentioned, there are pieces of, of debris, leftover parts, shattered pieces, etc. Um, the space junk. So here was shock number three, uh, when I did a calculation, uh, as a number of others have done, of exactly how much energy is carried by a piece of space junk. Um, so in orbit, uh, things are moving at a typical average um, uh, relative velocity of about 10 kilometers a second. Now that's very fast, okay? And at such high velocities, um, even small things carry a lot of energy. Um, so um, even something about the size of a sort of coarse grain of sand carries enough punch that you can uh, make a hole in the side of your spacecraft. Something the size uh, of a small glass marble, maybe you know, about the size of your thumbnail, okay, that um, is about the same amount of energy uh, as a really fast bowler delivering a cricket ball at your head at 100 kilometers an hour. A cricket ball, on the other hand, moving at 10 kilometers a second, is like being hit by a rocket-propelled grenade and can completely destroy your spacecraft. Um, now, things like this, um, uh, maybe 10 centimeters across, um, we can see those from the ground with our radars or our, our telescopes. They're tracked. We know where they are. All these things, and we think there are probably millions of them, we have no idea where they are. So the next thing I did was to plot a circle of 10 kilometer radius around the Royal Observatory. And you can see, and if I'm sitting on top of Blackford Hill there, um, if I'm looking for one of these small glass marbles, I need to be able to see it as far away as Delkeith. And uh, to see it within a second, okay? Now that's pretty tricky, but even if I can do that, one second later, wallop. You're hit, your satellite's dead. This, by the way, is why, why space might seem empty, uh, but actually it's quite full, because you have to take um, account of that kind of region of safety. That brings us on to shock number four, um, which I've been, only been really real, realizing is important relatively recently. So the stuff is coming back down, okay? Uh, so the rain of junk. So let's go back to um, our graph. Now this time, look at this gray line. Oh. Yeah, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> okay, first error tonight. It was all smooth until now, wasn't it? Okay, now let's try and be more careful with the finger. The gray line is the tracked debris, which you can see is also going up, but it's not going up as fast as the blue line. Now, um, that seems good. Okay, so we've got better at not making debris than we used to be, and this is true, okay, and that is a good thing, but mostly that gap is closing um, because it is now policy for various reasons to try and avoid making debris by deorbiting, as it is. You, you lower the orbits, you let things re-enter and burn up. Okay, so that's what is increasingly happening to uh, nearly all those things. But when something burns up, the stuff it's made of does not just vanish, okay? It's still in the atmosphere, okay? Some of it may slowly sink but most of it is still in the atmosphere. Um, and it's all sorts, to, 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 between the, the rockets going up and the satellites coming back down, we're depositing soot, aluminium, uh, nitrous oxides, and even charged dust particles, which um, uh, one of my colleagues, Sierra Hunt, believes could be um, altering the magnetosphere, which protects us from incoming um, cosmic rays. So it could be bad news. Um, but finally, uh, it's also the case that not all those things burn up, okay? Some whole lumps end up coming down. Uh, there's a, a spent fuel tank uh, somewhere in Africa. Uh, if you saw in The Guardian this morning, uh, there was actually a report of a piece of the International Space Station just landed on somebody's house in Florida, okay? It happens. Now, just imagine one of those little glass marbles hitting an airplane on the way down. 300 people will be dead. It, it's going to happen one day. Okay, so finally, um, the, I'm a physicist, so I like doing calculations. Um, but really, if you want to get this sort of thing across, 
Um, you, you've got to tell a story with pictures that engages people. So this is what Max is all about. Max made this amazing exhibition, Our Fragile Space, which right now is the, down there at the foot of the mound. If you haven't seen it already, go and see it. It is, it is wonderful. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Max, who will uh, give us a little bit more detail about what's going on. Hi everybody, how are you doing? Good. Have, have you seen some of you seen the exhibition already yet down there? So, okay, so it's a bit drier in here, and we're going to go through quite a few of them and tell that story. But uh, it's really amazing to be here, to be invited tonight. Thank you so much, Joanne and Andy, um, for for tonight. So, really appreciate that. There you go. Need the pointer here. Very good. Okay. So our fragile space. What 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 is this about? So the exhibition is about three different things. It's about how we benefit from the use of space, how space is starting to become very congested, and what we're doing about it. Those are the three basic ideas behind the exhibition. It's also about this is not an unlimited resource. People think of space as being an infinite resource. But near space around the Earth, where the satellites are, has really become part of the Earth's environment. I know Andy's working on the technical description of that, but I think satellites are coming closer and closer to the Earth. So we need to be good stewards of that environment, like any environment on the Earth. Um, so I used, um, you know, it's, photo it's a photography exhibition, so I'm using reportage and documentary photography, also portraiture, so we're telling a human story, space is about us down here on Earth, so it's very important to say that. But also I used some, some art photography, indulged myself, I haven't really done that before, first time I've really done that, to, to make the invisible visible, because we can't really see it, so to, to bring that tangibly back down to Earth. So I've worked in the space sector for about 10 years or so, as Joanne said, for the UK Space Agency and other agencies around the world. So I guess in some ways I'm an insider and I kind of know how the, that world works up to a certain point. I'm kind of in a unique position because I'm, you know, covering, oops, I'm you know, working with all these different agencies and, and government sectors. So to do this project, I had to work with space agencies, government, academia, astronomy, finance, insurance, military, so all those different fields. And I think the point of that is to get the job done here to change our behaviour in space, it's going to require all those different communities to come together. It's not, there's not one single solution to, to the problem. And uh, so I think, you know, I think I'm lucky that, that I can... Hopefully this project gives you that, that big overview of what's actually going on. So this, the starting point for the exhibition is, is really astronomy. That's my background. I studied it and I collaborated with a professor of astronomy, Ian Howarth, at University College London. And we sort of built a team of people. Stuart Clark was the writer on this project. He's working with Joanne now. So it was, a, it was very much a team effort to, to produce something like this. So astronomy is my, my starting point, as I said, if you can see that image clearly. Um, this is a picture I took in, in Chile for, um, in Paranel. Um, but it's really, it's the, the project is about many different themes, but it's about the loss of the night sky and the impact on astronomy, and that's really the starting point of the project for me. Okay. So the exhibition opened at Lloyd's of London, the, the um, global insurance market, and uh, so you can see it here on the right. It was opened by Tim Peake, the British astronaut, whose figures in the exhibition here. And uh, Joanne was one of the panellists. So a lot of things happened that night, and uh, we can talk a bit more about that later. But the exhibition opened... So Lloyd's really bought into this because they're very worried about risk. I mean, they've got very serious analysts, and it's a very uninsured market, so there's that side of it, but they're very concerned. I think I'm right in saying only 3% of satellites are insured, or, so it's, a very, it's an incredibly low number. But the, the exhibition... Um, we had this final transfer on the floor here, and it was designed by Rogers Architects, actually. They, they designed this installation here. But we have this... So you can see here at scale... Oops, didn't want to do that. OK. So if you've, you've got the Earth here. So I'm just going to indulge myself. We're at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So... Um, I got this 3D printed and it took me a long time to paint it as well, but for, for one of the photographs in the exhibition. So satellites used to be out at 36... Most of them were out at 36,000 kilometres, so in geostationary. So that's a fixed point in space. And they would sit over your country to give you telecommunications. 
that's a generalisation, but it's about three widths of the Earth. But now the satellites are coming closer to the Earth. They're only a couple of millimetres away at this scale, at low, low orth orbit LEO. Okay. So an average range for the Starlink constellation is 550 kilometres. So that's from here to London. So you could drive there in a day. If you could drive to space, you could get there in a day. So it's really no distance at all. So proximity is really important. And on the floor here, if I don't press the wrong button, so we, this, is, this is Leo here, and you can't see it, but up, we put something up here which shows you at, at um, where geostationary satellites are at that scale. So the point is that the satellites are coming closer and closer to the Earth. That's really the, the takeaway there. So the benefits of space. So we all benefit from space. You probably used, you may have used Google Maps to get here tonight. So, and you would have definitely engaged with space today. You may not be aware of it, but, but you have done. Telecommunications, I'll just run through some photographs now through the, the first chapter of the exhibition, if you like, about how we benefit from space. So it's all the economic, societal, and scientific benefits we get from space. And that's not gonna change, that's not gonna go away, it's only going to increase. So this is telecommunications. Back to the days of B Sky B and SES here. Um, back to um, so this a lot of the wealth of, of Luxembourg comes from from that sector and it still continues to be the case. Sat navs. So downtown Los Angeles on a Friday night, people are getting home probably using their sat navs. In that that's a trail of an aeroplane in the sky. They're using a sat nav as well. Farming. About 50% of arable land in the UK is uses um, sat navs or well, uses G GPS. So that yellow um, signal box at the top of the tractor there is, used, is speaking to a satellite for, for, for best practice on the farm. Photograph here in the west, uh, Western Highlands. So EOLS, a, a um, Scottish company, they're tracking, de um, tr tracking deer and they use that analysis for farm management. I believe there's an overpopulation of deer in, in Scotland. So more than about 60% of climate variables to measure the health of our planet is done from space, and that is only going to increase over time. So this is Sentinel-5P at Airbus in Stevenage, and they are um, looking for things like trace gases like methane in the atmosphere. So the use of space is, is increasingly important. This is SPY in Glasgow, so they're producing CubeSats. It's actually just that small... I pressed the wrong button that small little cube sat there. You saw the size of the previous telescope. Satellites are getting smaller. It's just the normal pattern of, of um, technology that it, it miniaturises. So this is uh, SPY. The satellite is, is um, looking at uh, weathering and uh, weather forecasting and has another application, maritime. Financial services. This is the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. So nanoseconds count. So when they're making a financial transaction, you get a competitive advantage. So the closer the satellites are to the Earth, so the internet, you know, the, so Starlink is providing global constellation of, um, for, for the internet use, but also financial services play a key role and uh, an investment for those constellations. Position, navigation and timing at sea. This is the port of Southampton. But the point of this photograph is, is that 18% of the world's economy, nearly a fifth of the world's economy, is um, supported by the use of space. And that's only set to grow. That percentage will only grow over time. And we're just probably at the beginning of that curve now. So the second part of the project, I'm going to depress you a bit for the next minute or two, um, anthropogenic change. So we're, unfortunately we're polluting on the land, plastic in, 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 the, in the oceans, and that's a good analogue for space debris up to a point, and carbon in the atmosphere. I flew a lot for the project. We're all to blame as a species, one way or another. And now there's, there's carbon in the atmosphere. And now this fourth domain of space. So I think we can apply all those same practices that were here on terrestrial on Earth to the near space environment or to outer space where the satellites are. So how much is in space? And Andy was starting to talk about this. There's about 10,000 tonnes of satellites, defunct satellites, rocket bodies and debris. That's about a scrapyard. If you can imagine a, a scrapyard, that's about 10,000 tonnes. Or the Eiffel Tower weighs 10,000 tonnes. If you imagine the Eiffel Tower, you might not think 65 years of launch, that might not be a lot. But there are 2.5 million rivets in the Eiffel Tower, and each of those rivets could take your satellite out, as Andy was, was saying 
before. So the tremendous energy in, in each of those. So 47% of 47% of what's in space is aluminium, and this is an aluminium scrap heap. Um, and uh, kind of when I saw that scene, that they looked like rocket bodies to me. So, so using serendipitous encounters to hopefully get a good picture and tell the story. Launch. So Joanne's working on this with her SE um, initiative at the moment. So launch regulations. I won't dwell on that too much, but there are some. So for for deorbit, actually, no, I'll, I'll come back to that point when I show you another photograph later. So noctilucent clouds. Any have people seen noctilucent clouds? Are at about eighty kilometres, hundred kilometres up. So they've only really been recorded since the Industrial Revolution. And they be a, may be a marker of climate change. And the rate of, of, of uh, noctilucent clouds has grown significantly during the space age. So it's an active field of research. And it's probably benign to human health, but you can see that we're changing our entire planet. We're putting new clouds in space, probably. So now the astronomy um, side of the project. This is Jodrell Bank, familiar probably to most of you here in, in Cheshire. This is the radio sky. You see this band here, and I've done that trick again. Okay. Well, the the, the narrow the, the the sort of less opaque arc is is the Milky Way, and the top is the Sun. The the strong arc is is geostationary satellites. So for radio astronomy, it's a bigger problem than optical astronomy, if I've understood correctly. Optical astronomy, it's a problem. It's a much bigger problem for radio astronomy. It's really noisy hearing all these satellites. Moira Bajar, so a slight change of pace here, a different look to the photograph. So Moira, through, through Andy and others here in, in, in Edinburgh, um, brought uh, Professor Mori Bajar. He's at the University of Texas at Austin. He's an astrodynamicist. They brought him over here, and he's now a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And he has a kind of a leadership role. It's more sort of a, a space environmentalist perspective and that that is coming um, and he's playing a kind of a leadership role in uh, in space um, in, in space traffic management now we've got some examples of, of uh, um, actual pieces of debris so this is the first recorded piece of debris that um, is an Aryan rocket that collided with itself for different stages We've got a fuel tank here. Andy showed a fuel tank. This was launched from Cape Canaveral, ended up 2,000 orbits later in Mongolia. So aerodynamically, um, fuel tanks can find their way back down to the Earth. So this isn't a real photograph. This is a piece of artwork. <laughs> um, but during, the project took about a year to do, to photograph. And every time I went to a clean room, to a space agency, to a museum, a private collection, I photographed examples of what's in space. So this is a very accurate representation of what's up there. So you know we not all know these engineering components, but if you see it, you know you have perhaps have a different response to it. So there are fuel tanks there, there are solar panels, rocket bodies, screws. I've got a cable tie in there, so you can see what's an aggregate of, of what's in space. High velocity impacts. Again, Andy mentioned that before, but the, the they're firing at the University of Kent just three millimetre wide um, piece of plastic into a, a copper block. And that's at twice the speed of a bullet. But in space, as Andy was saying, it would be 10 times that velocity. Andy showed a picture of, of, the, of the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a, the solar panel for the space telescope that they brought down when they repaired it. And it's got an impact on it. They'd have to do a chemical analysis to see if it was a micrometeorite or a piece of debris. But if it was a piece of debris, it'd be something like small as a fleck of paint or a small screw or something like that. Have some of you seen the film Gravity? Yeah. People nodding in the audience there. So the Kessler syndrome. So this is Donald Kessler. In the 1970s, he came up with this mathematical model. So as one satellite hits another, creates a debris field, and those pieces of debris have a cascading effect through um, it's creating a chain reaction here. So it's a pretty amazing experience spending a day with him. He spent a lot. We've got eight boxes of, of dominoes ordered from Amazon and got to his, went to his door. I drove up from Cape Canaveral to North Carolina. Lovely man. Go, you know, we spent a day with him, and he spent a lot of time with his wife working out how to to put this all together. So in 2020, um, last year in 2023, there were over 200 launches. 
So that's one every two days. So this is the beginning of the industrialization of space. That's we're living through that era now, just as the beginning of the industrial revolution. So we're starting, we're living through that era right now. So I saw, I'd never seen a launch in my life and I saw three in five days. Saw one in, this is Vandenberg Air Force Base and saw one the day later in Cape Canaveral and then one a couple of days later. So this is all Starlink launches. Have any of you seen the Starlink launch fly over? It's, um, it's an incredible experience. If you get a chance, it's an amazing 21st century experience. So after launch, they separate them out into this, this train or this daisy chain, and then they then form a matrix around the Earth. But you can see it like this if, if, you, if you prepare, if you can see that on the screen there, just about. So I'll just spend a couple of moments talking about this photograph here. Um, this is equivalent of a two and a half hour exposure in the dawn sky. So if you want to know technically how I did it, I did a series of one minute exposures and we stacked them all together. Working with Ian Howarth, he did all the, the, um, the work on the, the editing on this photograph, Professor Ian Howarth. Um, so Ian said to me, so this is Pentra Ifan in Wales, okay, and you've got Taurus, you've got um, Orion rising above the, this capstone that's been there for 6,000 6, years. Uh, 5,000 years. This is a 16 ton capstone. It's an amazing sight. And Ian said to me, we, You better be prepared for this night because they delayed Starlink launch by two hours and Starlink's going to fly over Wales. So you see that, that strong diagonal running through the picture, the strongest one. I'm too scared to press this button now. <laughs> so that, that, is, that is Starlink. That's the International Space Station. Everything else you see there are rocket bodies and satellites. So as Joanne was saying, you know, there were about 1,000 satellites roughly 10 years ago. Now there are roughly 10,000 satellites. There may be an order of magnitude change in the next 10 years. As Andy says, we, we just don't know. So you can see how crowded the sky is now in the two and a half hour period. So that's set to increase exponentially. This is on uh, tracking of satellites. I won't dwell on this too much, but this is in Hawaii. On the left is, is, is astronomy, and on the right is the United States Space Force and Air Force. So they're increasingly repurposing, or they, they're utilizing their facilities to, you know, for a, um, an attack to then look at space debris and satellites. And you can see a trail of a satellite in the sky there. This is a military facility in, in Madrid. And so they're tracking pieces of, of debris. And anybody see the oldest piece of debris there tracked? At, at the top, 1973. So that piece of debris has been tracked for 50 years. So stuff we're launching today will be tracked in the future for decades and, and potentially longer, if it doesn't do orbit. So um, space sustainability, what, what is that? So the circular economy, space environmentalism, sustainability. Um, Joanne's, I think we were talking about that l later in the panel, and Joanne's playing a leadership role with this. So, so deorbiting is one of the, the, the tools here. So to deorbit defunct satellites that, are, that could explode at the end of their lives, or they may be dormant and could be a threat. Uh, the UK government, this is a competitor to, to, to Astroscale, which the UK can, um, it's a Japanese company with UK interests. They're, they're growing in, um, in scale at the moment. And uh, so, but they've given 12 million pounds to this Swiss company, to Astroscale, because this is costing 80 million euros to, to deal with one satellite. So that's not sustainable financially, but they want to bring that price down, of course. But who's going to pay for that in the future? That is a, that is a challenge. So this is a, a drag sale, another way to deal with um, This is a... a Tiziana Cadroni, she's an engineer at the European Space Agency, so she designed this, uh, this drag sail to deal with a satellite. So this is singularly the most boring picture in the, photo, in the exhibition, but it may also be one of the most important. So Tiziana designed this system here. So one of the, um, the themes of the Edinburgh Science Festival is biomaterials. So this is her design for a biomaterial. This is made from flax plant, okay? So Andy was talking about when uh, they've already NOAA, the, the American science body, have done a study of in the upper atmosphere and they've found 10% of sulfuric acid particles have traces of aluminium and other 
um, get other minerals that you, that you only find in satellites. So that's already beginning. If you've got an order of magnitude, even if you're going to deorbit the stuff in the future, you know, there is no, if you say, throw something away, even in space, there is no away. It's coming back down to the Earth. And, and talking before about the impact on, um, on the marine life as well. So this could become a thing. Japan has just designed a wooden satellite. So literally, that will burn up in the atmosphere. <laughs> so what's going to burn up? Well, wood will burn up in the atmosphere. <laughs> Refueling. Again, space sustainability. So some of you may have caught a train here tonight, or a tram, and uh, they didn't throw away the tram at the end of your journey. So satellites, you know, like single-use plastic, you know, when you use them once, you want to refuel them and keep them in space. This is Orbit Fab, an American company with UK interests. So this could become mandatory on some satellites in the future. Maybe they'll regulate in the future for that. Space Forge is a company in Wales, and they... Um, they've got a heat shield to bring the satellite back down to Earth, okay, and then re repurpose the satellite and then take it back into space again. The circular economy. They, we, they, had, they tracked this, of course. They said it's probably going to end up in a tree, and it did. We've, we've, this is in the Brecon Beacons, and we drove across to Bath, and like, it was too, way too high to get it, so they had to get a tree surgeon to get it down. The 1967 Outer Space Treaty was rushed through two years before we went to the moon. There's the Artemis Accords, which an American-led consortium, um, well, American-led initiative, with um, I think the UK is a, a, a signatory to that, I believe so. And uh, about, I think nearly 20 countries around the world are now. So famously in, in 1967, so there were three of these signed. One was in London. This is the one from London, from Kew Gardens, which I found. One was in um, Washington. The other one was in Moscow. So even during the Cold War, they managed to sign a treaty for that. And, uh, but famously, there's no mention there of space debris. And that is a problem. So it takes 50 years to write maritime law. And we don't have the rate of launch. We don't have 50 years to write a new space law. So I'm, I'm straying into space law here one of the world's leading space story experts, so I won't go too far with that, but you get the idea on that. So civil society, Joanne Wheeler here, so um, she'll talk more, I'm sure we'll talk more about the role that, that Joanne's playing, but the role of civil society working with government, working with agencies, and working with financial insurance and sectors, so one of the levers for change um, and for an econo the economic driver for change in the use of space. Got my globe here. So this is uh, Professor uh, Marek Zebat. He's at the University of uh, UCL, University College London. So Marek works on a whole range of things, but he's developing metrics for how we can measure space. So we've got this very simple metric of 1.5 degrees Celsius for um, for climate change. So Marek's working on that. But the point of that photograph is that we um, we still have the world in our hands. Okay, so the exhibition's been running for about 18 months. I need to get some sleep. I've been working pretty hard. On the left there, the top left, I've been to Coventry Cathedral, been to Jodrell Bank, Lloyds of London, of course, here in Edinburgh. It's been to the Eden Project. It's been to Spaceport Cornwall, where they had launched there. It was in the marquee there. New York Stock Exchange had a small display there. Um, United Nations, they've got the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. And... Um, this is the, the then uh, director of, the Europe, of UN OSA. So that was there at the UN and had a uh, voice at the UN for, for what's going on in space. And on the right here is the European Parliament. So I'm very proud of the outcomes of the exhibition. So I know jo Joanne made some announcements at the exhibition at Lloyd's of London. This is a roundtable discussion which was held several months after that. And uh, so there's some fantastic outcomes. I was told that the exhibition has galvanised space sustainability for the UK government, and uh, space is now included in the purpose statement of Lloyd. So I'm very proud of those outcomes, and there's a lot more to come. So Joanne's here. This is um, this is uh, Carnegie Bruce Bruce Carnegie Brown is the chairperson of, of uh, Lloyd's of London, the science minister, and a lot of captains of industry in the space sector and senior civil servants. 
discussing the future and future architecture of space. So with that, I will just say a few thank yous. <laughs> I've got a lot of people to thank. And um, so thank you so much, Andy, through the University of Edinburgh and to help us get over the line here in the Royal Observatory, Edinburgh. So amazing with your help. And also Daniel Smith, who's here tonight from Astro Agency for his team. So these guys really made it happen. And you know, it's been on Scottish television. It's been in four national newspapers, Andy's story, and just fantastic coverage. And 50,000 people will see it here in the middle of Edinburgh. So just amazing, this collaboration to make all this happen. So very much a, a team, team effort. So thank you very much for the Royal Society of, of Edinburgh for having us here. Amazing to to be here today. Sky Rora, if Derek's here, Derek Harris, yeah, waving at the back. Thank you very much, Sky Rora, for your support for this. Appreciate that. Craft Prospect, these are all Scottish based companies now, Craft Prospect for data um, services, for downstream services. Alpha Data, Omanis Analytics, and Claire is here tonight. Claire Rumsey, thank you, Claire. And, um, and again, I mentioned AstroScale. So with that, I will pass you over to Andy. Uh, okay, so this is just a few slides that will lead us into the, uh, the question answer session we'll, well, the three of us will have together. So, so get your questions ready. Um, Right, so things are a bit worrying, as Max has been emphasising, and um, as Tolstoy said um, rather a few years ago, what then must we do? Um, now, it's very important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, because fantastic things are happening in Scotland in space. So, we make spacecraft, we make rockets, uh, we will soon be launching rockets, we build scientific instruments, uh, there, that's a part of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope built right here in Edinburgh. So we've got to find some sort of balance between encouraging economic activity on the one hand uh, and not going crazy on the other hand. So how do we do that? Uh, just a, f a few possibilities. Well, for Max and myself, raising public awareness is a, is a key thing. So that's what we're doing here tonight in this event. Max's exhibition. Um, I wrote a popular book, which you may enjoy. Um, um, we can get organised. So astronomers around the world uh, um, formed the Centre for Protection of the, of the Sky uh, under the umbrella of the, uh, of the International Astronomical Union, um, doing some marvellous work. Uh, we can cooperate. So American astronomers in particular have worked with SpaceX engineers um, discussing, you know, how do we make the satellites not quite so bright? How do we think about their aspect angle during the, uh, uh, the orbit raising phase? Uh, stuff like that. So all very useful. We can, on the other hand, we can get tough. We could litigate. Uh, so this was something I was in, uh, in, involved in, uh, writing a so-called amicus brief for a, um, a legal appeal made by a couple of companies against the uh, Federal Communications Commission, uh, claiming that they should have performed an environmental assessment before going ahead. Um, it, it failed, but um, it was, you know, it attracted some, some attention. Um, here in Scotland, we're, we're lucky. I see Christina grinning now. Um, we're lucky. We have something called Space Scotland. So it's a partnership of, um, uh, of uh, companies, um, academia, um, policy makers. Uh, and, um, and in particular, what we should be proud of, I think, is this document here. Uh, there's a Scottish Space Sustainability Roadmap. So it's ahead of the rest of the UK in this regard, which is important because space in Scotland is about to kind of leap upwards. Um, so number one thing I would say is to take the actions in this document seriously and push them forward. Um, so um, uh, Daniel and Christina and a bunch of others were uh, you know, very much the uh, sort of masterminds behind that. Um, um, but also nationally and now internationally, it's time for Joanne to blush again, because um, uh, this is the um, Earth Space Sustainability Initiative. So um, this is um, um, all about standards. Okay, so, and it brings together industry, academia, government, and most importantly, the finance and insurance industries. Um, so it's about setting standards which then uh, the, the, those financial industries will take seriously and hopefully turn into regulations. And that shows signs of really taking off. 
Um, so finally, what can the general public do? Well, in short, the answer is spread the word, I think. Tell your friends and neighbours if you think this does matter. Write to your local representatives. Just tell people about it and uh, get a bit of a buzz going. Um, so that's it. So um, I'm going to hand over again now to Joanne to be in, who'll chair this last session. The three of us are going to sit down here and take your questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, I'm sure you have some questions in the audience or potentially questions online, but over to you for questions. Comments? How wonderful the exhibition was, is. It's still open till the 18th of April, is that right? Any questions online? Otherwise, I'm going to start by asking a question. So, I have to we, speak. We there it is. <laughs> So just to follow up on what Andy has just said, the impact of our actions today may not be known for some time. Um, but what are some indicators over the next few years that maybe we should be looking at? What notable actions or behaviors should we be seeing that might give us a little bit more confidence, she says with her fingers crossed. Um, that shows that industry and society, finance and insurance are on the right path for space sustainability. What indicators might we, we be wanting to see? Uh, I have to say one indicator is, is simply your exhibition at the Mound. I think uh, once the government gave me, probably the best advice they ever gave me is, if you want to influence something, influence the man who watches X Factor. And actually, hearts and minds of people is, is key here, Max. So I think you've had a huge impact. You continue to have a huge impact. But what notable behaviours, what should we be looking at for indications that we're managing to deal with this space sustainability issue? You mean how, how will we know if it's, if it's working? If it's working. Um, well... <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, it's tempting to say the, uh, the rate of launch is slowing down, but I think that might be too, too much to hope for. Um, I'd like to see people in industry and in government making much more concrete statements rather than sort of uh, sustainability um, buzzwords. Right? Uh, um, so I, I th if, if I see actions happening that really are going to... Um, you know, uh, um, reduce the amount of aluminium going into the, the atmosphere or um, um, asking questions about uh, how many satellites you really need to deliver a service as opposed to beat the competition. Um, so, so that's all a bit very general, but I, th I think um, concrete statements rather than warm, fuzzy ones. And concrete actions. And concrete actions going with that, yes sector buying into you know the standards either through peer, you know, business or peer group pressure and signing up to the standards that are, are coming and you know the encouragement that they've been giving either you know through regulation or through self-governance so environment society and governance those three things that I know you're working on so that I don't know what the metrics are for those and how you how you do that but I suppose that's the barometer environment society and governance adherence to that and you do need a bit of governance, a bit of in inspiration and incentivization does actually help. Um, any questions before I ask another wonderful gentleman right at the back? Hi, um, Richard Osborne, Astro Agency. Um, my colleague Daniel is probably thinking, oh my God, what's he going to ask this time? Um, but you talk about the problem of... Um, spacecraft coming uh, or satellites coming back into the atmosphere and it creating an, an issue. So to some extent you have the law of unintended consequences in that um, the mandate is for things to deorbit after five years yet it could be creating a problem in the atmosphere. Would it not be 
a suggestion that you put things, or you get things intended, get them to deorbit, you try and put them in a graveyard orbit. So essentially, legally, you would establish an orbit to which satellites would ascend via propulsion at the end of their mission. And that way, you'd have some means, uh, some opportunity to potentially pick them up um, at the end of the mission then, at almost, almost like a space junkyard, I suppose. But that way, you're moving them out of harm's way. I don't know whether it's feasible, but it's, a, it's an option. And it, more opportunity for, for you uh, within the legal sphere as, as well, Joanne. And Richard, you mean this not just in geo to go up to geo graveyard, but also potentially one lower, a high lower Earth orbit, for example. Andy, do you have any comments? Max, any comments? Um, well, this is something that's evolved because I mean, for uh, for a couple of decades, um, as, as I'm sure you know, you know, guidelines have suggested either going down or going up uh, into a graveyard orbit, um, and um, recently because of the, um, the pressure to occupy those crucial low Earth orbit slots. The assumption has been that it's about going, going down rather than going, going up. Um, it, it's, it's a bit depressing that you, 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 you can't win. The trouble with going up, of course, is that um, precisely the things are there, then there for a very long time. So over longer time scales, the uh, debris problem is going to get um, worse and worse. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the, the, the solution is, and I, you know, I, I, th I think two years ago I'd have thought, no, bringing them down is, this, is, is the better thing. But I think the sort of evidence that Max was quoting about the, the amount of pollution that surveys have been finding that's due to spacecraft in the upper atmosphere is suddenly very depressing, because um, um, that um, really is, uh, is not working either. So I think if we can do it, um, that something like that circular economy that you you really reuse, um, but that's really a very difficult challenge for for industry. Do people know what a graveyard orbit is? So at geostationary, thirty six thousand kilometres, they push the satellites out to forty thousand kilometres, I think, and uh, so they park them there, and they use the last of their fuel to do that. So there's a cost to doing that. I don't know, Richard, about the cost of getting from Leo up to you know, for propellants and so on to get out to the graveyard orbit. But graveyard orbit is not like for everybody because those orbits will eventually decay and will come back down. All orbits will decay eventually over different timescales. So, you know, perhaps years for LEO, maybe decades for MEO and longer for GEO, roughly. So, but those orbits will, 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 decay, will decay over time. So are you just sweeping the rug under, uh, the dust under the carpet? Um a sort of LEO um, graveyard orbit, because obviously propulsion-wise, they're only going to have the capability to go up to uh, maybe um, several hundred kilometers over where they are currently. But even that, if it's a point at which things can then be collected, uh, you're, you're slightly improving the odds, because the, the technology will move on to a level at which we'll be able to uh, recover uh, space junk, hopefully. Um, Richard, I think it's a very good point, actually, because we've got the most important law in space is probably the law of big numbers. And there are a lot of big, big numbers and a lot of metal up there. And no one has really done the nitty gritty analysis of deorbiting hundreds of satellites. Now, five years ago, there was a study done by the European Space Agency about what's called atmospheric ablation. And we're now finding that the alumina deposits, et cetera, and that ablation is, is actually now slowly coming down and going into marine life. And that toxicity is, is, coming, is coming earthward. But no one has really done the studies of deorbiting hundreds of satellites. So could we find a safe graveyard orbit in LEO? LEO is 2,000 kilometers or uh, 1,200 miles or lower, uh, that we could then do active debris removal as long as there's not too much there, because you still need to get up to GEO and MEO, et cetera. I think it's worth looking at and actually properly assessing the feasibility of this um, at the same time as we look at that atmospheric ablation and the, the problem of deorbiting large numbers of satellites. There was another hand over at this side. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, hi, my name's Tristan. Uh, it's a question for Joanne. Um, do you think this is something we could have international legislation on? And if so, who would enforce it and how would it be enforced? So as you've heard also from Max t tonight, we have international treaties, resolutions, etc., but uh, no international law. And let me give you a quick anecdote. I used to work at the European Space Agency and um, this was the year after the Columbia shuttle had re-entered and it was not a, it disintegrated on launch. And a year after we were working with NASA and my boss jumped out the meeting and phoned me up and said, don't, th don't think about this too much, I need an answer now. We need, there are problems about the deorbiting of the, the next uh, shuttle. Could we jettison the fridge to, to get rid of mass and to um, re-enter safely? Now, clearly human life takes precedence over everything, but are there any environmental international laws that would deal with the jettisoning of a large fridge? I didn't ask if there was gin and tonic in it or anything like that. But um, we used environment, international environmental law, nothing to do with space law, to look at the, the pros and cons of this. But fundamentally, um, the life of the, of, of the astronauts was more important than anything else. This is why we're looking at standards, because standards can fit in holes of where international law does not exist and where law is, does not exist. And also standards can deal with the issue of international law not being provided and imp implemented homogeneously across the world. And states, as you probably know, are liable and responsible for everything that they launch into space. But not all states could be classed as responsible states because not all of them have the capabilities and the training and the skills that they may need to actually make those decisions. And implementing an objective standard is hugely helpful. So standards can be implemented quite quickly while we look at international treaties. Now we held our first space sustainability conference in 2001 in London held by Inmarsat. And we looked at an international treaty. And I have to be honest, by 2024, I thought we would have had an international treaty. We don't, and it's 10 plus years in advance. So the standards actually provide a stopgap that can be identified by industry, finance, and insurance. I've heard um, some, some wise heads of uh, other lawyers have, have said to me that um, uh, behavior doesn't follow laws. The laws follow behavior. So you've got to change the culture first, uh, and then the laws will follow. Would you agree with that, Joanne? Yeah, but I think we need to incentivize. And I think if we can incentivize right behavior, law will follow. But law takes a long time, particularly at international level, at UN level. It takes a long time. So let's start incentivizing the right behavior. Um, question, just the lady there with her hand still up. Thank you. And Hannah, please let us know if there's any questions online. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, so from your various talks, um, I have perhaps incorrectly, so this is a, a statement question, surmised that the worst case scenario here is that we have one of those, uh, did you call them a, a Kepler event? Kessler. Kessler event. Kessler. Um, where everything impacts everything else and you end up sort of clogging up the orbits and then you can't really launch anything or get people off the earth either, either for human space flight. And one of the possible best case scenarios is that instead of burning up the remaining satellites uh, as, through re-entry, you could actually um, recycle them. Is, is, that what, is that what you've been sort of saying? If, if you could... Uh, well, yeah, re, if possibly reuse rather than recycle. Same as on Earth, by the way, you know, re, reuse is what you want. Um, yes. I, I would say the thing about the Kessler syndrome is that people think of it as a kind of sudden catastrophic thing, kind of, okay, 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 bang. Um, it's not. It's more like the famous boiling the frog thing. We're in it now. It's developing slowly, and things are getting worse and worse. And it's a question of knowing well, when do you say that's too bad and we've got to stop. But so it's it's not a single event. It's a it's an ongoing unfolding of things just getting worse and worse. Absolutely. But the ultimate sort of threshold you like is that you would no longer really be able to use space for any of the things we're currently using it for. So you could lose yeah. certain orbits. Lose so certain orbits. orbits could become unusable at certain altitudes. Okay. 
Um, so should have made that point when we're talking. No, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So one last question and then I'll hand it back. Is if trying to get, what's the biggest, uh, aside from cost, I suppose, what, what's the biggest um, delay in getting companies and uh, governments to adopt changes that would be beneficial here? I, I, I think I think we go back to what Joanne just said just now. It's um, incentivizing. You, you've got to think, what, why would they want to do this? Because they're all desperately competing with each other. People want to make money. Um, so how do you make it in their interest to do good things? Um, yeah, so there are many, obviously, many good people mm. in the space industry whose instincts are good, but they still worry about you know, their, um, uh, their the, the bottom line. So it's... How do we, uh, yeah, money. <laughs> but it's per perhaps an opportunity as well because people in the space sector, they're monitoring the health of the planet and they understand you know, it's critical thinking in science. So actually they're an informed audience. Maybe I've got rose-tinted glasses on, but here in, in Scotland with this, the you know, Space Sustainability Roadmap, there's actually an opportunity in Scotland to be a world leader. And in the future, satellites will be mandated to have certain features. Like when they invented the motor car, eventually it was a seat belt in a plane, there are features mm -hmm. on planes. So there'll be an economic opportunity for the first adopters for the, when those new standards come to come mm -hmm. through. And Scotland's an amazing place to position to do that. I agree. We are seeing a race to the top where operators now seeking out regulators and a license that takes space sustainability seriously. Uh, we've seen companies, to be very open, leave the UK for various regulatory reasons, usually radio frequency spectrum, and coming back to license because they can get market access. If they get a license from here, they can then supply and provide services in other countries. Now that's a gigantic incentive, if there's that recognition of the UK license. And if you link that with money talks and uh, the availability of insurance, you've got a powerful mechanism. Another chance for another question? One at the front, thank you. <laughs> Is, uh, just a question here, a second in. Peter Black, I'm an Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Uh, I was coming at it from another way. One of the things you mentioned, Danny, was you know, less launches would be a good idea. Other technologies on the horizon that would allow for other companies that are trying to smother the Earth with uh, communications. It would allow them to have a lot less launches, like 10% or something like that. Uh, well, um, it, I think it comes back to regulation versus incentivization. So um, I don't, there's not much sign of um, uh, the US or the UK sort of putting a cap on launches. I, you know, I, I would dream of that, but it um, doesn't look like it's, it's going to happen. Um, so you have to somehow make it in their interest uh, not not to do this. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know the answer to that. And actually, I think we might want to encourage the UK, the, the Scottish launch industry. Um, Hannah, do we have time for one question right in the middle of the room? Thank you. Thank you. A totally lay question. Um, since it takes so long to organize things and get the world to agree to things, have you thought further afield what we're going to do about the moon and all the rubbish that goes there? And should it be like going up Ben Nevis that you bring your rubbish home? Well, there, there are 30 pieces of debris tracked around the moon today. So that's not that many, but it's the start. And of course, there's no atmosphere on the moon, so it's just going to crash land and it won't burn up as such. So that is a thing. There's a lot of people working on this already. It's the cis lunar economy, I think they call it, the, between mm -hmm. the Earth and the Moon. And uh, so that is a thing, and it's coming. A lot of people are already working on it. Good question. Thank you. I think we need to wrap up now. Really appreciate you all attending in person. I very much appreciate those of you online. And thank you for staying with us. Thank you for your engagement. Thank you for your questions. And please keep looking up and maybe see you in 25 years' time here and we can discuss the turning point that we've had. But thank you very much for being with us today.
you. Well done.